Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Raise the Vibe with Liz. I'm your host, Liz Peterson, and today I have Althea Provost, and I'm super excited to have Althea on the show. She's been part of my journey. I found her on John Burgos' show, Beyond the Ordinary Show. He's also been an inspiration for me. She did a reading for me back in 2018, I believe it was, and I'm super excited to talk about her new book, that she has out, but a little about Althea first before we jump into it. Althea Provost was born with her spiritual gifts intact, a natural clairvoyant with a propensity for precognition and an unshakable knowing her home was in the stars. Althea considers herself a soul traveler on an endless journey, drawn in by a sense of wonder for the unknown. A perpetual student with notepad in hand, she enjoys sharing knowledge gained from direct experience. As an energetic teacher, and author of Four Aliens and a Funeral, she serves to empower starseeds, lightworkers, and awakened folks everywhere. Althea meets you where you are and together. Higher Self to Higher Self provides now moment guidance. Her company, Thea's Heart, offers starseed adventures to sacred sites for initiation, activation, and to awaken others to their next level of awareness. Althea, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Liz. So good to be here with you. So excited to have you. So I want to jump right in. And I always ask my guests, what brought you to this moment in time right now? In terms of writing the book or just my life in general? How about yes and yes? And especially okay. around um, your contact experience. Okay, good. Um, I came in with knowing. So I had memory uh, of my continuous live stream, not everything, but what I would, what I would know in need for this lifetime. And one of the things that I was to do was to write a book. And I knew this early on. So five, six, seven years old, um, I knew I was to write a book. And when I wrote the, these chapters, they were for my blog. And I I was writing them so simply so that the people at the time could understand what I was saying because the UFO movement really wasn't um, mainstream. And so when I was guided to publish and write this book this year, I had fulfilled my contract. In fact, by the day I launched the ebook on April 1st for presales, by day six, I could not remember the content of my own book. In fact, I had to read my book because I was being interviewed. And it was such a surreal experience mm -hmm. because I literally gave the book away. These stories didn't belong to me. And I recognized somewhere in my journey that these these um, moments were so scripted that I was the scribe and it was my job to write them down, to not change the narrative other than for set and structure with my editor, um, but but not to change the original intention, even if it uh, even if I wasn't that person any longer or knew something more today that I didn't know at the time, that I was to turn the book over and let it go. God, I love that, Althea. And I love it too that you have this really strong inner knowing. Like things show up to me like that. I show up to an interview. I can't remember the book. I have to read it before the interview. But you have this inner knowing that you were assigned to do this thing. You did this thing. And now on to the next. Like you got the mission. You did it. And it's done. And move on. I love the clarity that comes with you and the work that you do. Thank you. It's It's a lot of inner work, as you know. You know, you it, it's like you might want, and I'm sure the audience is like this. There's something that you're going to want out of it, right? I mean, obviously, I'd like to sell books. I'm not embarrassed to say that. But at the same time, I would love to sell the book to the person who needs it and the person who has been waiting for some some form of a read that helps jog their memory and receive that insight that they didn't have the articulation for or that, you know, enable them to go farther in their own processes. And that's a joy for me. I mean, I wouldn't wake up every single day as a counselor if I didn't want to hear people's stories and let alone didn't want to go through the journey. Uh, you know, I'm here for that because it's so exciting to see other people stand up and stand in their own power and share. Yes. Yeah. 100%. I loved the book, Althea. I just finished it yesterday. And like you, you know, it's the story. It's this like confirmation. It's 
okay, somebody else is experiencing these. Or for me, like, oh, I've had that experience. That's what that is. You know, and I think we need teachers like you to kind of guide us in the direction of what this is, because I feel like sometimes I'm walking through unknowing and I hear from my clients, they're walking through unknowing. Everything's been thrown up in the air. We're really creating as we go along right now. And it's so quick. So for those listeners out there who aren't familiar with you and star seeds and what those are, let's jump into what's a star seed, the characteristics of a star seed, and how do we know we are one? So I don't define star seeds as it came to me. Uh, I had a teacher uh, named Lavendar who coined the term back in the 70s, and she was really the first person to launch it and set it out there in terms of the Palladian projects that the star seeds were tied to. Um, and she had broken it down through the astrology, astrological timing of a star seed when they're born. And she could say through her own uh, devices that they were tied to certain projects. So the, um, so uh, the Mar Mary Magdalene or the Cathars or these type of things. And she broke it down. And for me, that didn't quite fit. What I looked at uh, star seeds and how I defined it was people like myself who have conscious con cosmic memory, who have worked through various universi universities on other planets and are coming in with conscious awareness. So a starseed would have more than just earth-based understanding for their soul's evolution. And that's how I define it. Okay. So you said cosmic memory and conscious awareness. So what was this cosmic memory for you? You know, so I, was... I knew that as a young child that I had my family on ship. I knew 100% that I had my family and that when I came in, that I would go through this lifetime up until my exit date, which I knew, and that I would go through series of experiences that were necessary for my soul's evolution and for the things that I was here to learn. And as a young child, I knew that my uh, ET family would not interfere. They would be in the background, but they wouldn't go through an interference with me so that I could um, really get through life and, and assimilate in this um, field. Although I have gray awareness, that is just one of my many aspects, but that is the one in which I am working out thematically in this lifetime. And so the consciousness was that expanded awareness. I didn't get locked into the dimensions of 3D here where everything seemed concrete, real, knock on wood, and there was nothing outside of that, like a physicality. I absolutely knew that there was more to our existence than um, I was experiencing or other people uh, were relating to. I knew that I had more, more information. Wow. In the book, you talk about um, at the funeral, actually, which is I love that you pulled the title from that experience with your brother at the funeral, the four aliens in the bedroom and that contact. Was that your first experience of contact? That was my my brother's first contact experience okay. with the four grays coming into the room. And um, when I going back to cosmic consciousness, because I knew I had that and I knew that it really was uh it was a consciousness most people weren't willing to go to uh, and and or examine in their lives and or believe. And so knowing that as a young child, I had an, I, I understood that I was going to go through life without external validation and or any form of um, mirroring from any other person. It just wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we closed the chapter with my brother coming to me and literally saying, I remember the four aliens in the room. And I was like, he remembers. But for me, I would go back in and out on ship time, even as a toddler. So I had my aspect, that larger soul aspect still interacting with family. But on the, but in earth time, I was, you know, just a regular girl going through school and and having her um, ups and downs like everybody else. Yeah, how was that for you? Because it's, you know, an interesting experience to have our abilities open. We're having things show up in our bedrooms. We're having contact. We're having, 
dreams. How was that for you? And for those people out there are going, wait a minute, like, I really feel like I've experienced this. You know, I really didn't have anybody to validate me as I was growing up. So, you know, I, they were just kind of in my periphery. What do you say to that person who's had those experiences? Well, I would think today it's a lot different. Uh, we were talking before taping about Barbara Brennan's book of, of light, yeah. uh, I would go to the bookstore in my 20s, I mean, my 20s, and the, in the cult section, so regulated to deep, dark art stuff, you know, was Barbara Brennan's Hands of Light, which was <laughs> the lightest thing, talking about orb fields, you know, and today it's all over the internet. I would say the the one thing that our youth is contending with in Star Seeds that talk to me about is the mo is the overwhelm of information mm -hmm. and how divisive it, it can be. For myself, because I understood that I had this awareness, the most challenging thing that I had six, seven, eight years old, and this isn't in the book, but to share and answer your question, Liz, more personally and emotionally, was I could see when someone was lying. Mm -hmm. And their mask would drop and I would see behind their uh, thoughts. And as a young child, that was disturbing because I didn't have a sense of feeling like people would say what they mean and do what they say. There just wasn't a level of honesty on this planet. And when I understood that five, six, seven years old, uh, that that did change how I felt about humanity, to be honest. It's like I didn't have the compassion mechanisms. I had to be aware. Yeah, I resonate with that. You know, growing up with like ans asking the questions like, why is there this evilness, you know, to people? Why do people lie? Why is there this, that, and the other? And kind of coasting through, I really found myself as a child in this observer mode. You know, and, you know, yeah. being told also like those experiences that you're having aren't real. You know, those are just dreams or, you know, whatever it may be that, you know, the adults in my life were saying, you know, there wasn't that support, you know, for us. But I also think like, um, and I didn't really go into detail in my book, I call it the dark years just for to sum it up. But there mm -hmm. was a point where you do go through it. Um, you throw your hands up in the air and you just decide to get on with this life and to join the parade and the, the circus. And you don't, I, like for me, example, like I just, when I stopped tuning into my guides who were always working to keep me um, to keep me in an alignment and, uh, and informed that when I stopped listening to them, I made every conceivable mistake one could possibly make and pay for it. In fact, I was too shiny to lie. So if I did anything inappropriate, like as a teenage girl, if the girls went to the mall and stole something, I was the girl that got caught. Um, you know, if I was the girl to go out to a bar with girlfriends thinking I'm adulting in my 20s, I was the one that got the DUI, whether I deserved it or not. So it, I just didn't have the leeway that other people had. My, my life script was strict and narrow. So I would eventually have to come back and deal with my cosmic consciousness. And that's how the book starts. Wow, that is a really great way of putting that. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> a very narrow leeway. <laughs> I resonate. <laughs> um, I'm curious, like, um, I want to get back to um, the Grays and our star families. How does that show up for you, um, like, our forms in reality to you clairvoyantly, to the clairvoyant eye? Oh, gosh, what was it? Um from 2005 and 2010, I saw clients at my house. So they would come to the, to my house and into my little room and we would sit across from each other. And what would happen was they would either, depending on what their soul was trying to convey to me, they would sometimes disappear and a whole new being would be there. And I would see from insignias to spikes to collars to all types of ET presences at the point where I didn't have the verbiage, the description, even like the understanding to be able to describe to the person what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. um, some were a little bit more easier to describe. You know, grays are very typical. So you could say that I didn't have grays, oddly enough. I had, I would think would be like, I could, I can't really say today, but for me, it felt like 
the humanoid form of a star seed, mm -hmm. um, like a Pleiadian or a reptilian, these type of things. And, and it caught me by surprise, but I was fascinated by it. So I would see, like I said, they would disappear. I'd see these people. And then sometimes I would just see it as an outline of their face or a bust size from here over. Mm -hmm. And they would feel it. They, they would not only feel it, they could connect to it. So most knew it. It wasn't something like I was springing it on them or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But also with the ET, I, I saw their past lives and there was times when I could describe it so uncannily, like someone in the 19 um, Victorian times, I could describe the cameo they were wearing, the collar, the, the type of clothing, the colors of the clothing, how they wore their hair and, uh, and the validation from clients were just consistent over and over and over. Wow. I love how you're describing that when you looked at them and you actually were able to see their past lives, validating that all these star beings come down onto planet earth and have these lives that they're part of the cycle of reincarnation as well. And a bigger continuum than their own soul would. Like for example, the one woman uh, that I was describing uh, a being to, she was, she had, um, ships coming to her, her farm. And so the connection was there. It wasn't like, yeah. And you know, whether she pursued it or not, wasn't really my, my business. But as, when they were coming for readings at the time, I was seeing this, you know, just like I would see as a medium would, you would see your dead ancestors behind somebody standing there and saying, you know, and I don't do that work today. That's not the type of work I do today. But in the beginning, that was a part of my opening to these um, expanded levels of realms that other people were bringing to me. So. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. For me and for other friends that I've talked to, there's this, you know, little bits and pieces come in. Like before the show, I was telling you yesterday, I was looking for the title of this children's movie and I was going through the DVDs and just happened to stumble on a DVD that I got like five or six years ago from the Edward Casey Foundation, Raising the Inner Light. And in, in that talk, um, John Van Auken talks about uh, the Pleiadians and how Edward Casey brought, you know, that channeled information in and my whole body lit up. Like I had to run back to the DVD because I was cleaning the house and rewind it and listen to it all over again. And it's been like that. And I hear other people talk about it, how it, there's just like this little drop of information or this little nudge, yeah. like, Hey, I'm going to be with you on the call tomorrow. You know, we just did this class on me and one of the people that came had a session with me who has ET contact and guides. And, uh, and this person said to me, I had to go back and look at the Edgar Casey material and John Van Aken specifically. Wow. And I said, well, this is so interesting because, uh, I think it was John, don't get me wrong. I was, uh, at a conference and, I think it's John, I might be wrong. He got up on stage and was describing going to Egypt and he fell to the ground and had complete recall of his life, his Egyptian life. And when someone was standing over him to see if he was okay, he was like, Yew! and literally just was so lost in time. And uh, and my client had mentioned that. And so there's some uh -huh. type of synchronicity going on, although I don't know what it is. Definitely synchronicity going on. I attended your um, talk on me. It was fabulous. I loved it. It was like pinging me right and left. I've always had a desire to go to Egypt. I wish I could go with you in September. I want to manifest that into my life. Telling the universe right now, I'm putting a pin in that. And um, like I have horses it's been in my life since I was a teenager. I had a friend who used to make me mix tapes and put the eye of horse on the tape. Like it's been in my life forever. I've always had a curiosity. These things that pop in like, you know, Egypt and, you know, synchronicity and coincidence around these things. Is that part of that lineage that we come through, you know, as star seeds onto the planet? I, I think so. You know, for some incarnation at Egypt, the first time was where they stepped in as a soul. Oh, wow. And so when you go back and strengthen those roots and you remember 
you literally are re-strengthening the threads of the time you came in. They call it Zeptepi the first time. And you bring that consciousness forward. But what's delicious about coming into conscious contact is that you have the opportunity to say yes or no, maybe so. And but but, but the reaction and your response is entirely up to you, which puts you in the driver's seat of your life. And that's really, that's something to, to say. So when I said in the dark years, you know, I kind of didn't, wasn't willing to listen. I paid a heavy price. My life was not synchronistic. It was not in the flow. It was extremely painful. And I was havoc on everybody's lives. But when I stepped into flow, then it was like everything. It's not that it goes perfect. It's just that you get supported every single point in the way in terms of your ability to say, I'm going to have courage for my own life path based on my uniqueness. It takes courage to do that when fishes are swimming in a, in a sea of a different direction. Mm -hmm. I think too, we can get caught up in like the karma that we have to play out. I yeah. looked back on my life and there was a time where, you know, it slumped down. I was still, you know, of, ferocious learner, you know, and I'm like yes. gobbling up everything that I can, but very much like playing out that karma. And there was a definite date where, you know, my uh, relationship with those karmic relationships ended. What was your so, date? Um, mine, liberation, I'm going to call it, is <laughs> March, <laughs> mid-March of 2019. Mine was 2019. It ends the book. Wow. That was it. That, that, that was the final thing I, I had agreed to do. I didn't have to, in all honesty, talk about ETs any longer. There was nothing I had to do. Uh, the book to, to do the book was, was my give, my giveaway, you know, my love, my heart coming out and just, you guys have it, do what you want with it, you know? <laughs> and, um, but now it's like having juicy conversations the reason why I liked Neith going back to that course was <clears throat> I had a series of clients that had booked appointments and they were all on the same page wow. in terms of their capabilities. And, and I had one woman in, um, uh, who, who booked a session who said, can we do an interactive type thing? And I said, absolutely. I knew with my whole heart that that course would go interactive, that I had a group that was respectful enough and ready enough to speak their own truth and and share it with the group and that was so exciting for me so so i would say 2024 and forward i'm only looking to swim in waters that are so fruitful to me I that's it thumbs. yeah like period you know and i think that right there is great advice for our listeners like you are in control of what is in your energy field. Like, what are you going to choose for yourself? Yeah. And on a down day, um, you know, we all have them. Give yourself that down day. Don't make it two, three, four, five. Don't go beyond that. Literally make a decision where you are supporting yourself for your own evolution. It has to be an internal decision where you're going to put in that 10 minutes every single day to cultivate your courage, your strength, your voice, your, your action, whatever it is you're doing. I think it's so important that you do that because no one else is like, you're going to have to do that. And once you realize that you're creating the dream and action takes courage, you will get there. Eventually you're going to get there. So I'm starting a slow crawl myself, just, you know, sharing these little snippets and classes, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm drawing a crowd that I am blessed by that. I love to be with that. I, I honor. And that's so exciting for me. God, that's so, so exciting. exciting. It feels so in alignment and in a flow, in, the in flow. a flow. Yeah. And when we're in a flow, it's so juicy and it's synchronicities, coincidences. You're like overflowing with the next best thing. Like I have to remind myself, I don't have to be in push. I don't have to be thinking of what next, what next, what next, just be open to receive what is next and be patient. I think it's a, it's a combination of both, right? So it's like, sometimes spirit will say, Althea, you know, we want you to like I said, contact this 
archaeologist and I'm like oh my god I don't want to do that and you know but I do and there's yeah. follow through and good things that come from it so sometimes I'm guided where it's really out of the box and and extremely uncomfortable mm -hmm. but at but if I do that the flow picks up on another octave that I wouldn't have taken because I I just wouldn't have thought that way I wouldn't have thought to do that you know, uh, and so it's like, that's an example, like even with your podcast, I was like, absolutely, I want to be here with you, you know, and, and share this book, but share whatever comes to your heart, because there's this opportunity to work with someone who is so receptive to her own vibration and calibration of what she's trying to offer people that it's not this hard sell. It's like, let's gather, let's talk and just think about it. It's good. Yes. Oh, I raise our vibration. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I love how you're speaking to, um, I'm going to go back before, oh, just absorb those goosebumps. I'm just going to receive for a second right now. Love it. <laughs> uh, but speaking to your intuition, you're being given these, I guess, okay, this is what you're to do. Make this call. And not only are you listening to your intuition, but you're following through on the guidance yeah. that you're given. Absolutely. So there's a point in, in the book where I was driving in, I pulled up to our stop sign that faces our house. I opened up the garage and there was this BMW, this midnight blue BMW in our garage. And I thought, who's over? Whose car is that? I was just, and as I started to pull up our, our um, driveway is a slant. So I started pulling up, the car disappeared. And so I went into meditation and I said, are we meant to have a new car? because it's on my husband's side. My husband went and bought that car based on spirit saying, yes, you are to have this car. And at a point in time when money got tight and you know, a lot of people are there right now and we're really having to make hard decisions and we start to fall into that narrative of not enough, which spirit is really at this point in time trying to break that narrative down. And, uh, and so my husband had the car we had it for a few years and he went through a job transition where we really couldn't afford that car and he thought okay it's time to sell it you know it's been lovely i miss my car i love my car i'm gonna sell it but spirit said no and oh, it wow. was lean lean and mean to have that car uh and his his new boss bought it handed him the keys didn't even tell him he was gonna buy it bought it handed it back the keys and my husband drives that car today and his expenses on the car are covered and the fuel is covered and the car is covered and he still has the car today. That's spirit because spirit sees the bigger picture. We don't. All we see is a reinforced narrative on this planet, which is to make us go back into the first chakra of scarcity and lack and stay there. And we're not meant to stay there. We're meant to have a full conscious level of experience within our auric field we're meant to have more than than what is told to us now saying that i actually live very simply i really don't have a lot of things people are shocked by that i don't uh but i'm i prefer to live simply so that i can do more because i travel for a living that's what i like to do and to do that you know that means i need to get out there um now for other people who need and, and want more and have desires, that's that's different. I'm not the person who's going to help you manifest your dreams in that level with money. But I am to say that when you hear intuition and you follow that guidance and you're being told and guided to do the things you're doing, that is your e-ticket towards bigger, fruitful manifestations, but you have to trust it. And my book is takes you through chapters about trust mm -hmm. about trust yeah and i think trust is half the game like all of my spiritual teachers it's been this journey of trusting myself yeah. and then these things it's like okay you're not trusting yourself then the universe gives me things to learn to trust it that's it and they'll give you a series like small steps where you are to experience an aspect of yourself that you know is reinforced okay maybe i do maybe my intuition is telling me something here and if i pay attention to it 
So for example, I don't think I wrote this in the book, but there was one point in time where I knew my husband was going to get in a car accident. He was just working too much and too busy. And I was told not to tell him, you know, and he did get in an accident. So, you know, it was like, it, it was for my own inner knowing and to trust that that other person being my husband needed to have that experience for his own sake and evolution and slow down. But I also had to have the experience where I could see it, sense it, and honor the fact that I did absolutely understand the situation clearly and what was coming. Wow. What a great teaching moment on both sides. And to on have both awareness, sides. you know, to see that that was a teaching moment to show you that you did have, you know, that ability or that awareness about you for our listeners that are listening to you and they're having these awarenesses like this and maybe they're thinking you know intuitively like do I have these connections am I a starseed like how is this showing up for um those who don't have that inner awareness that weren't born with that knowing but they're having these little clues like dreams or mm -hmm the little bump on the finger that you talk about in your book, you know, I had one last week. I'm like telling my partner last week, I'm visiting him. I get these bumps on my fingers and they just itch. Right. And then I listen to your book and I'm like, what? And then I call him like, guess what? <laughs> That's what this is. Like, what are some like signature things that we experience that would point to that we are actually having these experiences without having the conscious realization about it you mean so what would other people have like in terms of cosmic conscious experiences where yes. they can say hey maybe i'm having something yeah. oftentimes it'll start with like i described in my book where i where my dream times be began to take on very significant teachings so i would go up and i would be on ship I would be um, experiencing something that would then unfold the next day, like your red bump, right? Mm -hmm. The synchronicity was in play. Uh, this is an oddball one, but one of my girlfriends who came on my very first Starseed adventure, she had a dream where she was up on ship and she had many fingers and she was working a panel. And she had went to, in her small town, like a Mississippi type thing, she went to, I think, a post office and someone said, nice hands, saw you last night. And there was an instant, yes, wow. there was an instant, and we call them familiar strangers, where you meet someone and they are verifying your own dream. They're verifying aspects of what had occurred in their dream time and your dream time and you're sharing it. So dreams can be very powerful. I talked about how I was having a dream and there was a gray, she was wearing a hoodie and she had barrel curls and long blonde hair. And she kept going like this, pointing to her third eye where there was a ruby crystal. And I was going to travel to Starseed Australia Adventure, which was my first trip. I had no money, no book of clients. I didn't even have a website. I didn't know anybody in Australia. And literally, synchronicities came together where I was going to speak at a, a UFO con uh, uh, conference. I mean, it was just crazy and meet all these UFO people and whatever. But in dream time, I was specifically told, let me just put preface this, you're to go um, outside of Sydney to a specific area where there's an ET community. I mean, I was told in miles what to do mm -hmm. on this trip. So before I went again, I had the dream and the ET was pointing to the crystal to prep for the fact that I has, I was going to meet Judy Carroll who wrote the foreword of my book. I opened up her book just to a page and it happened to be on the chapter colors ET by day, um, yeah. Okay. So, so in this chapter, she talked about how the ETs wear colored crystals. So again, wow. the dreams were extremely synchronistic and powerful to help me understand those two levels of consciousness working into my conscious awareness so that I can, ex so that I could have the understanding that I'm making contact. That's one of them. Another one was, and it happened on, on um, Starseed Egypt Adventure, I was flying back from Uluru into Sydney with our group, and I 
suddenly just got knocked out and my head went straight down and onto the little plastic table that you eat on on an airplane. And then I woke up with a deep breath and I had on top of my knuckle a red dot. Wow. Like I was pulled out and then right back into an experience where I was not going to remember. So the red dot is for the readers who haven't read my book, uh, are, I call them shots of non-remembrance. And it goes across other species, not just grays. A Pleiadian uh, friend of mine had that as well. And it's where you are giving yourself a shot so that you are not bring you are not going to bring in the information that you just experienced as a soul on another level into this time because it's like wacky cracker you don't need to be working out two parallel lifetimes at the same time you know we're not meant to have that braided level of consciousness working with us all the time they call it dual souls some people Susie okay. Hansen wrote a book on that but anyways so it's a choice you make the choice to do that and um and if you itch the red dot immediately it's itchy it's itchy it's, itchy. it's painfully itchy <laughs> yes I've had it my whole life it is so itchy and then oh, I question I'm like you know after reading your book and getting that validation I'm like why do I give myself this shot? And you just explained it just then. So I want to thank you because it's that dual lives. And I often say to my clients, like, if we were given all of it all at once, it would be crazy making, like it would be too much. I had two very strong female friends of mine uh, that one was a Pleiadian, one was a reptilian that I met. And uh, I mean, very strong women, very, very, very strong women. And the Pleiadian said, uh, no, I'm not going to take the shots of non-remembrance. And she's had lifelong contact. I mean, she can describe everything to a T. And she came down and the information was so much for her brain. She couldn't get out of her bed for three days and stared at the, at the ceiling for three oh. days. She just could not operate her body. And that was it. Yeah, I think that would be intense because sometimes I wake up from dreams and it takes me a whole morning to process right. the dream. Right. I had an interesting dream um, a couple months ago where I'm up on a ship and I could move, I could uh, pilot the ship with my mind. That's right. And there was a woman that I all of a sudden noticed, I'm like, oh, she can see me doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had that um, internal program come on that were programmed within this lifetime, I think as children through movies and media that it is um, scary to have these gifts. If you tell or share that you have these gifts, something's going to happen to you. The government's going to come and get you. Like I had this thought in my dream, like, oh, she sees me, the, they're going to come and find me. So I've got this, like I'm there and I'm doing it, but also I've got, I'm working out that program of being seen. You know, right. working out that program of, you know, unraveling that fear that we were That's programmed right. through movies and media oh. around the fear of coming out. Right. And I think that's that's so important to say because, you know, I work as a counselor. I'm here for the empowerment of other people. And that does not mean that my truths are their truths and they have to swallow my truths and probably don't even want to hear about it, frankly. Mm -hmm. And it can be very triggering to release a book like this to a, to my audience that might not have any interest in it. And I recognize that because there's a program here on the planet. And I talk about that. And I think it's in the first chapter of the book. When I came into my gray awareness, it was the last species I would want to even have a, a, a comma gray alien after my name mm -hmm. because of the amount of disinformation and the fact that they're constantly being blamed for all the world's problems. And there's this American narrative that I knew instantaneously was not only tiring to me, but that that it was filling the minds and hearts of other people who wouldn't even have a chance to make up their own mind. It was being instilled, you know, like when my brother's generation were, uh, were taught that you know, the Russians were going to bomb us or, yeah. you know, I mean, we're taught these things, you know, that there's going to be a nuclear bomb. You're going to go under the, the desk type thing. We're programmed in a certain way through levels of fear so that when we come into these 
um, types of co cosmic consciousness, we're not going to see them through eyes and neutrality. We're going to see them through our perceptions that have been heavy laden by a society and social cultural programming yeah. that's saying it is not safe for you to know that. And that's triggering our first chakra. That safety, right back that to, fear, the right back to the first chakra. First, they're going to get you with the money. There's not enough. The world's going to blow. It's going to end that, you know, that you're, you're not going to have friends. Everybody's going to think you're crazy. And then, you know, then, and then if you start looking into this information, you know, someone's coming at you at the middle of the night, you know, it's going to yeah. prey on these <laughs> ridiculous things. And, and I end the last chapter again with my brother who took a completely different stance than I did where he went into fear-based, you know, learning to defend himself, this type of response. Mm -hmm. Whereas I just was like, they're my family. You yeah. know, they're my family. They're a part of my lineage. And it's so and out like there. Family, I remember. Gonna... Yes or no. Yeah. I remember, God, it was over 13 years ago. I was living in Palsbo and I'm on the computer and I'm surfing and everything. And I come across this page that talks about, um, I think the lizard beings and how they're recycling our souls back onto the planet and then you know we have the big um you know big show okay they are real there was the press conference and everything then everything's being leaked and i you know overheard something on you know the computer once again you know there was a president that signed a thing in exchange for um a technology that you know oh. the aliens could abduct us <laughs> if they wanted to and i'm like what you know there's just this great fear narrative so Althea, is there anything that you can share with our listeners that would kind of, um, you know, kind of erase that fear narrative, you know, and really like have some context as like, who are these beings and, you know, what is their purpose on the planet and how are they helping us? All right. I can't speak to the larger purpose of the planet or larger purpose of all the millions of species, um, you know, uh, Interdimensionals and extra dimensionals are, are ETs. I, I can't speak, I'm not their voice. Right. I can speak from my own personal point of view. Please. And mine is, is I've had positive contact all my life. I have not had negative contact. Uh, I don't go down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. I, as a clairvoyant, do see, you know, trouble times, obviously. I'm not a Pollyanna. But my vibration is attuned to uh, the positivity that I can bring into my life. And so therefore, I, my book is going to be positive. And, that, and that's different than maybe other people's books and experiences. But that's my experience in which I'm responsible for. So I think ultimately is we're responsible for what we put out. Mm -hmm. And we're responsible for the narrative that we have. And I do think that in evolution of our consciousness, we can at a certain point see things quite differently than we did from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so I look at evolution as growth. What are we here learning? Think about it like this. I love to teach circle consciousness where it's not a a pyramid scheme where I'm the teacher and everybody's below me and I'm the one that knows everything and no one knows anything and they have to hear my pearls of wisdom. I don't come from that channel. It's not my way. My way is a circle consciousness where everybody who is coming has something important to say and are bringing their own perspective. And together through sharing, we can learn something more than the sum of the parts. So when I look at this planet and I think we're sharing it with the creepy crawlies and we're sharing it with the four legged and we're sharing it, it's a shared planet. And they each have a perspective and a place and a purpose on this planet. And so does cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. It has its own evolutionary track. And we're slowly getting to the point where we can begin to understand that everything has its place and purpose for its own evolution. So if someone wants to go down a fear track and, and play cops and robbers and all that stuff, good for them. I'm sure it's exciting and not as boring as my life, but I enjoy um, sharing from a perspective where the children can not be 
infiltrated by a narrative that would shape their perspective towards not accepting their own wholeness if they had these memories and children today do yeah they they are i mean my youngest client was a kindergartner wow so it's important for us to recognize that there's a there's a, a system out there that that we can send out a ripple whether it's one person or not and that they can that they're going to be affected by what we say yeah as good as i can say that I love that. Thank you, Althea, for saying that. And it's such a fresh narrative. And I loved that about your book, that it was so positive, the perspective, because I have to unplug all the time from everything. I have my little cabin in the woods and I don't watch the news. I don't have cable. I love it. A minimal living. I love to travel and I love to surround myself with people, places, and things, you know, that will raise my vibration. Like what through them do I want to experience? And that's the highest and best, you know, right. the love and the light. I know all of this other stuff is out there. You know, I'm not, you know, wearing rose colored glasses or having blinders on, but I'm not wanting to give my energy, you know, over to I'm the- I'm not going to empower it. I want, yeah, I want to empower the light, you know? Yeah, the- well, I want to empower the life where someone can get up in their day and feel like they can make it through their lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, it's like, it's I don't want to be the reason someone says, well, screw this. I'm not going to be here, you know? And it's like, no, I, I want people to have a full and a full and exciting life to the best of their ability, but they have to watch what they consume and they have to be careful about how much they're consuming. So I talk about, I, in my book that I had precognition since childhood. And that means my inner TV screen would turn on and I would see future forward moments. And I, this still happens. And I would see outcomes of things that personally, I didn't want to even have to experience. They weren't a part of my heart's desire for my life, let alone my family's life and friends. And, you know, that's a bitter pill. So when I see something like that, I also understand that we're contributing to a whole through our decision-making, through our own conscious agreements, and that sometimes we do and will take turn, take a dark turn down a road, um, you know, where we're harming and hurting people, innocent people. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's going to be the next wave of lessons that we have to learn and look at deep hard what are we doing with our time and efforts what are we empowering and that's why i said it's a cultivation um i'm empowering a positive lifetime for me uh i'm empowering a, a speech that enables others to learn from if they so choose and i am not being grossly unaware that there are other people who are working in the opposite direction yeah and that's called earth right <laughs> those polarities man that's the polarity um, i like it too that in your book you talk about i think you were just talking hinting to it there too is like choosing a higher timeline for yourself and you tell a great story in your book um about a moment on a boat where you're out in the water and you have the choice to choose a different timeline can you speak into that oh i'd love to so i my my husband and i were on vacation we had one free vacation and we were trying to keep that feel good moment. We had made a conscious and deliberate intention to have something to look forward to later that year. Because when you look forward to something, your endorphins, your, your dopamine rises, you, you get this feel good feeling. We wanted something that continued that feel good feeling. And at that moment, I had looked at my email and there was this invitation to swim with the dolphins in Bimini and the price was right. And we didn't know the person, but I was like, let's just, you know, throw one into the, into the mystery box and go. And we did. And we got there and we met chaos energy from the start. It had nothing to do with us, but we were determined, look, we're in Bimini. We're going to swim with dolphins. It's gorgeous. You know, there's no snow. It's not Colorado. We're happy. And so we stuck to that narrative. And what ended up happening is I had a with a group experience, a UFO, and through the UFO, the UFO was showing me through iconographic images, a timeline. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was just, it was late at night. And I was, I couldn't take in all the directions. I didn't have pen and paper to write every single thing and to code the images, but 
the next day when I was swimming along the Bimini Road, I recognized the iconographic images in the scene and I began to understand, oh my God, there's a, there's a skull, there's a turtle, there's a, and I said, oh, this is a timeline. Wow. What they're showing me is a timeline. And ultimately I learned that one of the persons on the boat who I did not know at the time was planning on leaving the planet and that she would die on this trip and that she would her body would be transferred back onto a ufo as crazy as it seems that is what was going to occur and i'm now fast forward we're swimming in the water she was going to let go of the ropes and she was going to pass on it was her exit window mm -hmm. she was well aware of it and this was one of her points in time and I recognized because I knew what was going to happen, an older dolphin swam up and looked me eye to eye and had this immense peace around it. And at that point in time, I made the decision to raise my hand, to stop the boat, get out of the water and go recalibrate to the vibration that I had consciously set before going on this trip, mm. which was to keep the feel good feeling going. And I removed myself from that. I honored her. Now, before I say, I didn't leave her stranded. When she recognized we're back on the boat, just let me back up here. We're back on the boat. I had to see this series of images. I started to cry and I said, I looked her in the eyes and I said, stick around and kick ass. Stick around and kick ass. And I wanted her to know, I knew what she was doing. She knew what she was doing, but she wanted nothing to do with me. She avoided me until we got in the water. So then I'm back up on, on the ship. They're still swimming with the dolphins. Time is going by and I'm working on my energetic field. No, I honor her decision, but this is my decision. I'm choosing this for my life. And eventually the boat came to a stop. Everybody came back on board. And I was laying down, eyes closed, and she stood right next to me. She came up and she said, um, it didn't work. And I, I, I dialogued with her and I asked her what, and she basically said, I changed my mind. And I said, good. And that was as much as we were going to talk about it at that point in time. We did keep, we're still in contact and we do exchange. And I bless her for allowing me to tell that story because it's important for us to all remember that we have this very powerful mechanism, which is to direct our lives by choosing what we want to do with it. And if we are willing to have a courageous life, to have a life that is meaningful to you, you will be met and supported. You, you will. It's just about showing up for yourself and honoring who you are and your unique narrative that is important to you and needed at this time on this planet. It's needed. We're all needed. And so if we do our little part, we don't have to do the big part. We don't have to solve you know, the, you know, the problems of the planet mm -hmm. that has its own evolution. But if we do our part, we are a part of the solution. Yes. And it doesn't have to be big. It can just be the little things every day. And thank every you day. for speaking to the choice that we have choice. And it is really hard right now. So hard. And it's been hard for years. And, you know, a lot of people are thinking about that, but we, we need your light, everybody. Everybody. You need to your light. And there are simple things that I do, uh, you know, to shift my vibration. Um, I turn on empowering music. And I make sure I move my body. And as much as I don't want to, sometimes I have to get up and walk because I sit for a living and I work with my eyes closed. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for me uh, to not clairvoyance at a certain point when they keep doing this work tend to go blind. They lose their physical sight because they develop their third eye to the point where you can see driving with your eyes closed. My teacher could do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so because that isn't the narrative I want, I have to go out and work with my eyes and be in sunlight and and and, and walk and physically strengthen my body. It's 
literally more important than meditation for me at this point, that I'm physically active uh, and have balance in my life. So for me, so for other people, that might be something different. They might need meditation five minutes a day. You know, whatever it is that you're doing where you're cluttering, one of my favorite things to do before night is that I take a balloon because it's just elevating and fun. You could take a rose or any object of, of your privy. And I put the day's energy and everybody in it and I blow it up so that their energy goes back to them. So if I've taken on anybody's thoughts or something's racing in my mind or just even good feeling thoughts or feelings, actions, beliefs, I send it back to sender as pure energy. And it's just a way of emptying out so that my next day isn't a follow through of the day before. I really make that decision to break the narratives from day to day to day uh, so that I can be fresh and available for today and accept the now moment. Oh, I love that too. And that's a great exercise and you made it so tangible because mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff that we do and practice is in our minds and it's using mm -hmm. our imagination and our imagination is the gateway to reality, everybody. So follow your imagination, but it brings it into physical form where you're blowing up that balloon and popping it. I think and then if they, if they wanted to add on to it, which is it's a little dangerous here, um, I, I tend to synchronize my org field to the gold light mm -hmm. and I like that gold light and I do that every night. So I just, I clear out and then I recalibrate to my light and, um, I ended up like buying nothing but gold flowers like that month. And then I suddenly I needed gold jewelry. It was awful. Like I wanted to surround myself by gold. But I find if you calibrate to your unique color, you can strengthen your own soul's presence and remind yourself who you are. And you might know what that color is for you. But again, it's it's putting you back into the driver's seat. You know, I'm strengthening myself here. I'm as important as anything else I'm doing here on the planet. I'm important. I like that. And I want a little bit of clarity for listeners and myself, that golden light that you speak of, would that be um, an extension of the golden egg, the seventh chakra, or are you envisioning your aura as actual like gold? Because I, I do the aura as gold um, simply because when I went on my very first walkabout, I was called by spirit two over two dec decades ago to go to New Zealand and I had a lot of resistance on going and I wanted to outsmart spirit I wanted to figure out why I had to go right I needed the reasons and all the things and of course I, I couldn't and when I was finally in New Zealand and this was before I was going to have a major awakening third eye opening big powwow moment I walked into uh a, a nature store that happened to have a reader there and I booked a session like it was our last session and I was like I'm gonna find out and we sat down and this golden energy came between us and lit the room and she said I know why you're here she said I can't tell you what's going to happen to you but I can tell you you have choice oh I love that and then she said she said uh Everything we do is by choice. And that gold energy went away and there was more. But ever since then, the gold energy has been coming to me and that's why I use gold. So there isn't anything thicker or more than that. <laughs> when I talked about white Reiki, when I was doing sessions, I called it white Reiki because at the time that I was learning Reiki and I had clients basically any warm body, neighbors, friends, anybody I could beg to come over and work on them before before I had paid clients, I would stand like Frankenstein with my arms stretched out like this. And they wouldn't let me lower my hands. I was just shoulder level like this. And I said, what am I going to tell these clients? What do I say? They said, call it white Reiki. I said, why is that? And they said, your entire column is white light. Wow. And of course, I didn't believe him because I was at that point where I was like, yeah, show me, huh? Bet me. This is where I was at at the time. Just really full of resistance, you know, super fun. And um, the good times, we'll call it that, <laughs> the good times, you know, before you're like really good girl. But anyways, uh, I was at an international new age trade show and they were taking orc 
pictures and everybody had these beautiful purples and blues and greens and yellow and they took mine and I thought something was wrong with the camera it was all white all white That's right you are bright <laughs> I can't believe it this hour has just flown by it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show Thank and you. talk about your book and I've another full circle I'm having all these full circle moments this year it's really amazing really amazing Thank you for having me. And everybody, I'm going to have Althea's website, theasheart.com. Um, Thea, you also host um, Starseed Adventures. You have one coming up to Egypt. I do. And uh, my book, For Aliens and a Funeral, the paperback launched today. I would love your support if you would like it. Today's crucial in terms of numbers. Small plug, but I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to travel with me, you can look at some of my past experiences. There are past travel experiences. I've been going to global sites for um, quite some time and it's a pleasure. It's a it's soul work for me. It's, it's actually soul work for me. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Althea. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, everyone. Check out her website, theasheart.com. Get her book. It's fantastic. I highly recommend it. I'll have the link down in the show notes. And um, there was one more thing that I wanted to say. Oh, interesting. Poof. There it, it goes. Went. Althea, thank you so much for joining me. And everybody, thank you so much for joining me again. I'm Liz Peterson, and this is Raise the Vibe with Liz. You can find me everywhere on social media and my website, raisethevibewithliz.com. And remember to get out there and raise the vibe, everybody. Thank you, and have a great day. Bye now.